Welcome to the School of Ministry with Dr. Miz Mzoke Tenkredi. I am excited that the Holy Spirit led you here today. I know for a fact that your life will never be the same again. I just hope you are also excited. Just make sure you have your Bible, you have your notebook or your notepad with you. Today's class is dubbed the School of Prophets. The School of Prophets. And of course, we are going to focus on two things today. The ministry of a prophet and the prophetic grace. Most people don't know that there is a difference between a prophet and the prophetic. The prophetic is not a prophet, and prophet is not the prophetic. Let me say that again. A prophet is not the prophetic, and the prophetic is not a prophet. You can be prophetic and not be a prophet. You can be a prophet and not be prophetic. It will make sense in a while. It comes down to functionality. And before I miss you there, let me quickly give you an example. In Genesis 20 verse 7, God calls Abraham a prophet when he was talking to Abimelech. But we have never seen Abraham prophesy. Why will God say he's a prophet, yet he never prophesied? It's because his ability to hear God and to do exactly what God was saying was on another level. And that made him a strong vessel in the prophetic. And God called him prophet. Yet he was not prophetic in a sense of prophesying. But hear me here. His functionality was faith. Hence he is called the father of faith. So you can be a prophet, yet your functionality is not to prophesy. It will make sense in a while. So let me not get ahead of myself. Let's quickly go deeper into this. So a prophet is here and the prophetic is here. What is the prophetic? The prophetic is methods or dynamics that God uses to speak to his people. While it's a prophet, it's just a container. Let me break this one down. God can speak to me and say there will be fire there through a dream. God can speak to somebody through a vision and say there will be fire there. At the end of the day, we see fire. Listen, we received a similar message, but the methods, the dynamics were different. But guess what? What we also came to pass. We are in the prophetic, but guess what? We are not using the same channel to see or to hear from God. So when it comes to the prophetic, understand that the prophetic is dynamic, not static. And once you understand that, you'll be a strong vessel in the prophetic. A prophet is a container. A prophet is God's divine agent of help. He is not just an agent, but he's a divine agent of help because through a prophet, God walks. Through a prophet, God appears. That's why in the Bible, the word of a prophet was actually the word of God. And no one and no man could negotiate with the word of a prophet. What I wish our generation understood, especially this generation, our dispensation, is that having a prophetic gift or being a prophet, it is actually a beginning. It's actually the start of your journey. And in this journey, you will need to be equipped. In this journey, you will need to be informed. That's why when you read the Bible in the book of 2 Kings, not only do we see Elijah as a great man and as Elijah's success, but Elisha continued to run the school that Elijah ran, and that was the school of the prophets. I want to quickly go deeper. The first thing that I want you to understand is that when it comes to being a prophet, not all prophets are the same. Not all prophets are the same. And what makes them different is their area of specialization. Or rather, let me put it in a way that church people will understand. But I know you watching here, you definitely understand. Uh, what makes them different is their functionality. Prophets are like doctors. If one has uh, a toothache, and decides to go to a GP, a general practitioner. Listen, that's a doctor. 
They studied medicine at school. That's why they are called a doctor. They are a qualified doctor. Now, the doctor will begin to check you and realizes that, no, this person has a tooth problem. You know what the doctor will do? Will then refer you to a specialist. And that specialist is not just called doctor. It's called a dentist. Both of them are doctors, but their functionalities are not the same. One can check you to refer you, but one will fix your problem. But the one who fixes your problem is a specialist. Then when it comes to prophets, not all prophets are the same. They are prophets who are specialists in certain areas of grace. I'll say that again. There are certain prophets who are specialists in certain areas of grace. And of course, here I'm talking about the anointing. So not all prophets are the same. So the first thing that you need to know and you need to be awakened to is what kind of a specialist am I? What that means is what type of a prophet am I? And of course, we have like nine types of prophets that I've taught on before. But I want to quickly give you seven because the seven is the most important one, especially in our time. So there are seven types of Prophets, and let's quickly break it down. Number one, we have what we call prophets before, or the before prophet. Now, the before prophet are called the born prophets. Let me say that again. Prophet before, or the before prophet, or the born prophets, right? So the reason why they say prophet before, it means they were a prophet before they came into our realm, which is the earthly realm. Jeremiah 1.5 declares, Before you were formed in your mother's womb, I knew you. And not only did I know you, I ordained you a prophet. A prophet to nations. Remember that. Put it as a side note. Two nations. It will make sense in a while. Jeremiah is moving. On the earth, but he was a prophet before he was introduced to this world. So these are prophets, not because somebody prayed for them. These are prophets, not because they desired the prophetic. These are prophets, not because they woke up and they became prophets. No, these ones, they hear God, not because of other things. They hear God because they are born prophets. They have what we call the spirit of prophets. And of course, every prophet who is in this category has the spirit of a prophet, but it will make sense in a while. The second type of a prophet that we have is what we call the cold prophets. The cold prophet is not like the born prophet, because the born prophet was born a prophet. I mean, the word says it all, right? Then the cold prophet means this person was not born a prophet, but they were called into the office of a prophet. They were called into being a prophet. That's why the Bible declares in the book of Ephesians 4, and he called some, meaning they were not, but they were called. The reason why I call somebody, or the reason why I will call you, the reason why you call somebody, is because they are not with you. So you cannot call somebody who is with you. If somebody is with you, you just talk to them. But if I call somebody, it's because they are not with me. So when one is called into the office of a prophet, it means they were not in the office of a prophet. I'll give a scripture. In the book of Amos chapter 7, verse 14, Amos says, I was not a prophet, neither a son of a prophet, but I was a headsman, a gatherer, of sycamore fruit, and the Lord called me to be his prophet. And he said, go and prophesy. He is clearly stating to us that even his father was not a prophet. So he did not have prophetic genes. He did not have prophetic connection, but he was a gatherer of sycamore fruit and a headsman. But God called him to be a prophet. There are people who are not born prophets, but because of their hunger, their zeal, their zeal, their desire, their faithfulness, and the amount of time they spend 
in the secret place, God now will call them into the office. And most people who are called into the office of a prophet, yet they were not born prophets, are intercessors or watchers. And that is because they spend time tarrying in the presence of God. They spend time concerned about what concerns God because all intercessors carry a burden. Hence, we always say, you cannot be a prophet and not be an intercessor because every intercessor is a prophet and not every intercessor is a prophet. Listen to this. Every prophet is an intercessor. Not every intercessor, though, is a prophet. I'll say that again. Every prophet is an intercessor, but not every intercessor, though, is a prophet. So you cannot be in the prophetic and you don't have an anchor. And that, is, that anchor is prayer. This, the third type of prophets is what we call the seasonal prophets. Now, these ones are not born prophets. These ones are not the cold prophets, but these ones are prophets for a season. All of a sudden, God calls them into the office of a prophet. But before you know it, they will come out of that office. Basically, these are visitors in the office of a prophet because they are not there to pack their bags and stay. Example, we have a man called Jonah who is sent by God to Nineveh. We all know the story. I don't want to go there and explain a lot of things. He prophesied and all of that. And as a matter of fact, his prophecy never came to pass. Yet the Bible doesn't call him a false prophet. And that is because he did and he said exactly what he had God say. And I'll explain why that prophecy never came to pass as I go deeper. Yet God had spoken. Watch this now. After that, we don't hear about Jonah. We don't see Jonah prophesying anymore. He was sent to Nineveh and Nineveh only. And from there, he was retired. He retired. Why? Because he was a seasonal prophet. There are people that God will call them into the prophetic office or into the office of a prophet, not for a lifetime, but for a season. It could be in that town, there is a drought. In that town, the word of the Lord is rare, and God will raise that person for a season. And after the person has done what God wants them to do, God actually will remove that covering of a prophet or the spirit that he had put in him, and is called the spirit of a prophet. Let me move on because of time. Then we have the fourth type. Now, the fourth type here, or number four, we have what we call mysterious prophets. Here we see this in the book of Mark, chapter 9, verse 38 and 39. These are prophets, but these are mysterious. Mysterious simply means hidden or unknown or not yet revealed. That's what mysterious means, right? It's mysterious, not yet revealed. So they are prophets who are mysterious, not revealed to people, but they are prophets. In the book of Mark chapter 9, where we, uh, I just quoted now, verse 38 and 39, the disciples of Jesus came across a group of people who were healing people, delivering people, praying for people, and they came back to Jesus and his master. We saw them that were casting out demons using your name, but they are not part of us, and we stopped them. Jesus said, why did you stop them? They are not with us here, but they are part of us. I will give another example so you understand. Elijah stood and said, I'm the only prophet remaining. And the Lord said to Elijah, you are not the only prophet remaining. As a matter of fact, I have 7,000 prophets. Elijah was a prophet. And he thought to himself he's the only prophet, yet they were mysterious, hidden, unknown, not yet revealed prophets. So they are prophets. Yes, they're in that office, but not yet revealed, revealed to men. And God will forever reveal them or will forever bring them forth when there is an emergency and when there is an agency in the spirit. These ones are not always hearing God. They are not 24-7 hearing God. They are not 24-7 seeing in the realms of the spirit. But guess what? When there is a necessity, all of a sudden they hear. These are mysterious prophets. Number five, we have what we call made prophets. 
I'm sure you are going to like this. Made prophets. Now, made prophets, the word on its own says it all. They were not prophets because they were born prophets. They were not prophets because they were called into the office of a prophet. They are not even seasonal prophets, but they were made. Now, example, we have a man called Elisha. We know what God said to Elijah when Elijah was in the mountain, when he gave an instruction to say, anoint Jehu, anoint Haziel, anoint Elisha, the son of Shephard. But wait a minute. When he hit him with his jacket and Elisha left farming and followed him, Elisha was never called, as a matter of fact, son of a prophet. Elisha was called servant of a prophet. There's a huge difference there. While it's those that were in the school were called sons of the prophet. Why? Because they were already prophets. But him, he was not a prophet. Even though he was following Elijah for a long time, he was never called a prophet. Elijah, yes, uh, moved with Elisha, but he was never called a prophet. It was until when Elijah was taken that the spirit, watch this now, the spirit of Elijah rested on Elisha. So we remove the spirit of Elijah in Elisha. Elisha is not a prophet. What makes him a prophet is the spirit of Elijah. But if Elijah was to be alive, Elisha cannot operate as a prophet. So he's made a prophet by another prophet spirit, and that is Elijah. Then when Elisha went back, he, Jordan, Jordan separates and he goes back. The sons of the prophet saw him, the Bible says, and they knelt down. And they said, surely the spirit of Elijah rests upon Elisha. So it is important for you to understand that there are prophets who are not born, who are not cold, who are not mysterious, who are not even seasonal, but made. I'll give another example. In the book of Numbers, Moses cannot carry the burden anymore. He then states his matter before God. He says, God, this is too much. I can't leave these people alone. It's, it's really troubling. It's burdening. God said, no problem. Choose among the elders, 70 elders. Go to a place like this, and while you are in the tent, I will come, and I will speak to you. And Moses did exactly as God had said. And God came down. And the Bible says, and God said to Moses, take a portion of your spirit and give it to the 70 elders. And Moses took a portion of his spirit. I want you prophets, people who are in the prophetic, to pay attention here. God did not come down and say, since they are here, let me give them my spirit. God uses an existing prophet to give something to the ones he's raising. I hope you heard me. He takes the spirit of Moses and he gives it to the 70 elders. As a matter of fact, Moses is the one that gave it. And the Bible declares, they began to prophesy non-stop. They were going crazy the whole day, prophesying because of a potion. And the man who heard the whole potion, who just gave them impartation, so to say, was sitting in the tent like this, not going crazy. Yet them, because of a potion, they were going crazy. These are prophets that are made, not born. That's why they are prophets by replication. They were not prophets but they replicated a prophet. They were not prophets. They were imparted, and they began to move in the prophetic. And some were given the spirit of a prophet. And guess what? They became prophets. Yes. Remember, hear me very well here. Because you are in the school of the prophets, you need to know this. Remember, the Bible declares that the spirit, in the book of 1 Corinthians, that the spirit of a prophet is subject to another prophet. It does not say the spirit of a prophet is subject to the Holy Spirit. No. The spirit of a prophet is subject to another prophet. Meaning, hear this now, prophets have their own spirit 
called the spirit of a prophet. And what makes a prophet a prophet is not their desire. What makes a prophet a prophet is not their zeal. It is not 24-hour prayer every day. It is not spending too much time in the presence of God. What makes a prophet a prophet is the spirit of a prophet that comes on a prophet. And once that spirit comes on you, you might be a nobody. You might have been a nobody. You might have been an usher. You might have been a choir leader. You might have been uh, somebody who's serving. And all of a sudden, you start moving in the prophetic and you're in the prophetic office. Why? Because when the spirit of a prophet comes, one turns into something they were not. Number seven, a silent prophet. The seventh type of a prophet here is a silent prophet. These ones are in the prophetic office, but they are silent. What that means is, though they are a prophet, you will never hear them prophesy. Example, Abraham. Abraham was a prophet, but we have never seen him prophesy. Why? Because he was a silent prophet. And what made him a prophet was his ability to hear and follow what God was saying. And that made him a strong vessel in the prophetic. But however, he had a functionality. He had an area of his specialization, and that was faith. So silent prophets that I have met, yes, they are a prophet, but most of them, they will move mightily in healing and some also in deliverance. These ones, their area of specialization is healing, but their office is prophet. So they are in an office of a prophet, but they themselves, you will hardly hear them prophesy. But their ability to follow what God is saying and God's instructions makes them a strong vessel and a strong power, a strong force, so to say. I wanted to say force, then I said power. Still okay. A strong force in the prophetic. I know I said I will give you seven, but let me quickly give you eight. Then we have what we call a Yare prophet. The word Yare means a chosen, marked, set aside, set apart. We know that. Yare prophet. A Yare prophet, these ones, right, uh, nobody knows if they were born a prophet or they were called into the prophetic. All they know is all of a sudden they became major prophets or rather great prophets like Moses. Moses was a Yare prophet because he crossed the line of being a prophet and God said, I will make you a God. These are, we call them governmental prophets, you know, for a lack of better words, because when they speak, they can speak judgment on a nation and that nation will be subject to their judgment. They can say a word to a nation and that nation will dance to that word. So these are Yare prophets. Not all prophets can speak a word against a nation and all of a sudden what they said will come to pass or what they said would begin to happen. Only Yare prophets. I hope and believe now you understand the different types of prophets. So the most important thing as you are here is to know what type or rather what kind of a prophet am I? Because God cannot use you while it's your ignorance in what exactly you are all about. And that's why I always say, when God calls a man, he can call you, and you know that he called me, right? But then again, before he commissions you, he will college you. So when God calls a man, he colleges a man, then he commissions a man. It is in the colleging that God will actually reveal to you the type or the kind of a prophet you are. Ah, most of the things, they actually happen in the colleging. Like I always say, when he commissions you, he commissions you because already he has capacitated you. And it is in the commissioning that God will give you four things. Let me say that again. When God calls a man, he commissions a man, right? But before he commissions a man, he colleges a man. He calls you to commission you. But before he commissions you, he colleges you. He capacitates you. Then when you are capacitated, he commissions you. But in commissioning, he will commission you with four things. He will release you with four things. Number one, the mandate. 
What is the mandate? The mandate is the message, the message you have. Remember, you are going to be a doctor in your own area of specialization. You're going to be a prophet. Remember when we spoke about a doctor. So you're going to be a prophet in your own area of specialization. So he's going to give you a message. That's the mandate. Because your message cannot be another prophet's message. One way or the other, it has to be different because you are sent to a different people. So you will have to, you need to know my message. What is my message? What is the message that God has given me to these people or for his people? Just in case you are not clear or you are not 100% sure if the people you are dealing with, they are the ones that God wants you to deal with. So there must be a message, number one. Number two, God will give you grace. And when we talk about grace, we are talking about validation. We are talking about the ability. We are talking about mental. We are talking about gifts. We are talking about the anointing. We are talking about, you see, that's what grace covers, right? Exactly. What validates you, that is now grace. The third thing that God himself will give you, and please never forget this, is resources. And whenever we talk about resources, we are not just talking about material things. People are also resources before God. So when God commissions a man, he does not just commission you to start wandering. No. That's why he told the disciples, don't worry, they will take care of you. Don't carry your pairs. They will take care of you. If they don't, shake the dust. If they don't welcome you, don't, don't even bless those people. Shake the dust of your feet and leave that place. You see what I mean now? So God will make sure that there are resources. That's why we are always saying, if God is not providing, yet you think the vision is from God, revise the vision. Number four, God will give you a platform. You can't say God has called you and has commissioned you to be a prophet and you don't know your platform. It's an error. Either you have mistakenly thought or you have mistakenly confused your season of manifestation to your season of preparation. You are still being prepared and you think it's your season of manifestation. I hope you heard me there. So it is important for you to know that when he calls me, before he commissions me, he colleges me, capacitates me, then he will commission me with these four things. Being what? Being the message, being the grace, being the resources, and being the platform. So when you go out then with these things, what you then need to master is the three building blocks of prophecy. The three building block of prophecy happens during the season of college. And some of you don't understand that right now you're being college. And some of you already God has released you. But he has to, he has to bring you back here so that you can learn certain things. So that certain things you can get confirmation. Right now some of you, whatever I'm teaching is like a confirmation because you already knew. Some of you, it's new. And right there, you are being built up. Right there, you are being informed. Right there, you are being capacitated. So there are three building blocks of prophecy that no matter who you are, no matter where you are, if you are going to know and follow these three building blocks of prophecy, you will forever prophesy and you will never be in error because of these three building blocks of prophecy. Like I always say, don't really focus on what we call something. Focus on what it means. Because if you only focus on what we call it, Calling things and giving things names. You know, with time, these things, they change. But meaning remains the same. Now, before I talk about the three building blocks of prophecy, let me quickly explain what prophecy is. Whenever we are talking about a prophecy, and in this case, we are going to give a definition of what a prophet is, using the original translation, enabai. Some they say enabi, enabai, right? Now, because for me to explain prophecy, I need to take you where it all began. So a prophet was called enabai. And why? Because they had believed that a prophet is the one who, he who bubbles up 
and gives out an inspired word of God. And they said, this is an Abai. And later on, a prophet. So a prophet was a prophet back then because he will give out an inspired word of God. And that inspired word of God is what we call prophecy. So if we say somebody is giving prophecies, somebody is giving out inspired words of God. And prophecy stands on two pillars, forth telling and foretelling. Those are the two pillars that pro- prophecy will stand on. And of course, you, do, you have born prophets, right? I'm going back to the types of prophets, who are pre- or post exilic prophets, right? Who will go even to the past in their days so that with the information of the past, they can predict the future. But in our days, it hardly happens. I'm not saying prophets don't go to the past. No, 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 no. There is a huge difference because people think going to the past is when I say your grandfather's name is this. No, that's the spectacular of the prophetic. Okay, <laughs> okay. And I don't want to talk about that. We'll talk about that a little bit later if we have time, okay? That's the drama or the dramatic part of the prophetic. And that's not what we are talking about today. Here we're talking about the, uh, the, 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 the prophetic and the office of a prophet. Watch this. So, prophecy stands on two pillars. Number one, foretelling. Number two, foretelling. When I foretell, I am talking about the future. I'm dealing with the future. It has to do with the future. When I foretell, I am dealing with the present. It is important for you to remember that. So, every time a prophet stands up and prophesies, either is giving what? A prophecy that has to do with the now or a prophecy that has to do with the future. So every time you stand and you say, I'm going to prophesy to this person, understand, am I going to give a word of the now or of the future? That will always help you to move according to the will of God. Let's get to the three building blocks of prophecy. Number one in the three building blocks of prophecy, the first block, write it down is what we call prophetic revelation. Prophetic revelation. Prophetic revelation. I'll say it one more time. I'm repeating it so that you'll never forget it. Prophetic revelation. What is prophetic revelation? Prophetic revelation deals with the will of God. Amos 3.7 declares, Surely the Lord does nothing unless he reveals it to his servant unless he reveals it to his servant, the prophet. Why will God say in his word, unless he reveals it to his servant, the prophet, not unless he reveals it to his prophet? Because for a prophet to receive revelation from God, he must be a servant before he becomes a prophet. That's why he says, unless he reveals it to his servant, the prophet. His ability to humble himself, even though the word he had received might be against what he likes, who he loves, But because he has a spirit of a servant, he will still carry on with that word and give it the way it's supposed to be given to the people or to whatever. But listen to this. Prophetic revelation deals with the will of God. So there must be a revelation for a person to prophesy. And it is within that revelation that God has put his will. Until God gives you a revelation, you will not know the will of God. So the first building block is what is the revelation of God? What is the will of God in this revelation that I have? Ah, this is too deep. This is too deep. But then again, in the revelation, I would love to break something in the prophetic revelation. We have different ways of receiving the revelation, which then contains the will of God. Uh, There are about so many ways, but I'll give you maybe four or five. Let's see. Number one, through dreams. Some receive the revelation through dreams. When they are sleeping, God will appear to them and God will speak to them. So on the prophetic revelation, like I said, some God speaks to them in dreams. Here we see God, rather in the scripture, saying, Numbers 12 verse 6, If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will speak to him in a dream. So God does speak to prophets in dreams. And believe it or not, God speaks spoke more 
to his people in dreams than him speaking to them directly. So we have God speaking to his people through dreams and in dreams more than he spoke to them face to face. So you must master the realm of dreams as long as you are a prophet. Because the realm of dreams is a province of all prophets and all seers. So you cannot say you are a prophet and you despise dreams. You undermine dreams. You neglect dreams. You are not serious about your dreams. You are not a prophet. You are not in the prophetic. Or you are not yet taught. Because that is number one office where prophets will go to in order to hear or meet God. And that is because dreams are the highest form of revelation. That is the divination of dreams. That's why when the Holy Ghost comes in the last days, three methods God chose. He said they shall prophesy. They shall see visions. They shall dream dreams. You see, even when the Holy Ghost comes, he will cause people to still what? Dream dreams. So it is important for you to understand the importance of dreams. Job 33 verses 14 speaks. And it says, God speaks to every man once yet twice, but man perceiveth it not. The word perceiveth it not there is the word man is unable to interpret it. Verse 15, it says in a dream. So God speaks and he does it through dreams. And most people will receive the revelation through dreams. And the second method or another method that God will use is visions. And most people, they love this one, right? There are visions of the day. Some they hear God through visions of the day and some visions of the night. And if I was to be deep, since I'm in the school of ministry, we are talking about internal vision and we are talking about external vision. External vision, this is where you are awake, but at the same time, your spirit travels. While you're, while you're looking at somebody, your spirit travels. Or while you're doing something, your spirit travels and you find yourself in another place. While your eyes are open and it's a vision, but this one is an external vision. Then the second one is an internal vision. And most people will love to call it the vision of the night. And that is because when it happens, it happens from within. And in most cases, it will happen when you are sleeping. Internal visions are different from dreams. And that is because God can drop a vision now and you download it tomorrow. And not because you are meant to download it tomorrow, but your, your ability to fathom it, right, was the following day. Or you got the ability to, afford, to fathom it. Or you were aware of it the following day. That's why it says God speaks once to every man, right? Speaks once, yet twice to every man. But men perceive it not in a dream, in a vision. You see that now? So even when it comes to visions, others are not able to perceive what God is saying. So God can drop a message in your spirit today and you download it in 40 years from now. And that now depends on how strong your spirit is. Remember the book of Luke chapter 1, verses 80, 80. It says, and the child John waxed strong and he grew strong in the spirit. So there is a necessity and uh, it is important for you to be able to build a strong spirit, especially if you are in, and especially when you are in the prophetic, it's important for you to do that. Because you can never access other dimensions until you have a strong spirit. What qualifies you and what becomes your key to other dimensions is your spirit. So if you don't have a strong spirit, you'll be denied access and you'll wonder why I'm a prophet, but I can't access this and I can't access this. Yet I'm a prophet and I know I'm a prophet. Is because you don't have a strong spirit. So when it comes to visions, you must have a strong spirit. That's why visions can be induced. Unlike dreams, visions can be induced. Of course, one can induce dreams, but visions are easier to be induced than dreams. And of course, then there's another method here that God will uh, usually use, and that is uh, prophetic impressions. Remember in Daniel 7, when Daniel said, the visions of my head. It seems as if you are thinking about it. It seems as if you are the one reasoning around a subject or a person or a place or a people. Yet at the end of the day, what you are having is visions of the mind and we call them prophetic impressions. And most of the time, you see it happen and say, but I was thinking about it. I was thinking about this person. You know, along those lines, I've taught a lot about that. It's because what you were having 
was prophetic impressions. It was not just you thinking about somebody and they started calling you. No, you were in the prophetic. That's why it's important for you to have a strong spirit. And the fourth one here is what I call revelation by word of knowledge. Here, you can receive revelation not because you dreamt, not because you saw a vision, not because you had a mental impression or visions of the mind or prophetic impressions. No, you look at somebody and you know. And that's now where the word of knowledge comes in. And most people in the prophetic rely on this one because when they look at people, they call out their, peop their names, they call out their address, and they call out all of these things is because they are in that element. They are in those elements or in that uh, category, in that field of just knowing, revelation by knowledge. Then let's quickly move and go to the second building block before I uh, lose you. The second building block is what we call or what I call prophetic interpretation. Remember, the first block is prophetic revelation. What is the will of God? And how did he give you that revelation? Then we stated the methods. But now, what does it mean? That's when prophetic interpretation comes in. So prophetic interpretation simply means, what does it mean? You have the revelation, yes, but what does it mean? And the reason why there must be an interpretation, because in the prophetic, not everything you see is what you see. You can see something, yet it means something else. Hence, interpretation becomes the most important part and the most important block in the three building blocks of prophecy. Uh, the book of Job 33, verse 14 says, God speaks once, yet twice, but man perceiveth it not. Man can't interpret it. Why? Because interpretation is something that needs you to be very prophetic and spiritual. So it's not God who's not speaking. It's man who's not being able. It's, not, it's man who's not able to interpret what God is Say, the word interpreter is actually two words coming together, inter and preter. Inter is from the word enter, meaning get inside, and preter is to dig. So every time when somebody is interpreting, they are actually thoroughly investigating something. So when we are saying you are interpreting, you are interpreting something, you are not just investigating, you are thoroughly, you are going inside, you are going deeper. And when you come out with a meaning, it will blow everybody's mind. Because interpretation is not translation. I'll give another example you guys understand. In Jeremiah 1.10, God says, what do you see? He says, I see an almond tree. And God says, you have seen well, for this is my word, and I'm about to perform it. Wait a minute. This is my word. I will watch over it, and I will perform it. Wait a minute. Why will God say such words, yet the man is seeing an almond tree? Because an almond tree is not an, always an almond tree in the eyes of a prophet. In the book of Zechariah, and you read chapter 4, Zechariah is asked by the angel of the Lord, what do you see? My man says, I'm seeing candlesticks. I'm seeing a lampstand. I'm seeing a gold bowl. I'm seeing seven pipes. And I'm seeing two olive uh, trees. And the angel said, do you know what you have seen? And the man un understood that mm -mm, this is too much. And the angel said, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. It is not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Listen, how does this... Verse 6 of saying not by might connect to candlesticks, to pipes, to gold boughs, to two olive trees, you see? So not every time in the prophetic, when you see something, it is what you see. It is very important for you to go after interpretation. I was giving a prophecy recently at church, and a woman is standing in front of me, and I said to her, I saw three arrows, two shooting this side, and one shooting this side. And arrows, they simply means children. But if you see two going to the right, these are boys. And if you see one going to the left, this is a girl. So if you saw two going to the left, it means two girls. If you saw two going to the right, it means two boys. Then I said to her, I saw three arrows, two on the left, one on the right. These are two boys and this one girl. How many kids do you have? Three. What and what? Two boys. And one girl, one daughter. Why? How did I see that, right? I didn't see two girls and 
I didn't see two boys and one girl. No, I saw arrows. But because I know and I understood the interpretation, I know what it means. It's like certain numbers in the prophetic. You need to know them. Because interpretation will come from, you need to thoroughly investigate. God can never use what you don't know. God is not a God who confuses people. He can never use what you don't have. He can never require out of you what you don't know and what you don't have. That's why scripture said, be fruitful. It never said, be seedful. Meaning God already had placed the seed because he would not have said, be fruitful if you do not have a seed. He cannot require out of you what he did not put inside of you. He cannot ask of you what he knows you cannot produce. He cannot ask of you what he knows you cannot give. Because, example, he never asked for a, a child or for a sacrifice of a child uh, when he was dealing with Abraham before Abraham had a child because he knew Abraham was not going to be able to give him a child or sacrifice the child because he never had a child. God had to wait until Abraham had a child and God said, Sacrifice your son. He will always ask and require out of you what he knows you can produce. So when it comes to interpretation, some of you struggle because you are limiting yourself when it comes to learning. All you have in your mind is the Holy Spirit will teach me everything. And when you read the Bible, Bible was written by men. The books of Paul, that's men. When you read the book of Peter, it's men. When you read the book of John, it's men. So the Holy Spirit is teaching you through men. And he will forever teach you through men. Because there are those that went ahead, that have seen things, have understood things, have downloaded mysteries, have spent time with the Father. Because not everybody can fathom the realm of mysteries. We can fathom, all of us, the realm of knowledge. But the realm of mysteries, not everybody. The realm of revelation, very few people. But the realm of knowledge, everybody can fathom it. The realm of mysteries. That's why Peter was the bishop of the church. He was the leader of the church. His name was the, uh, was the first man to be changed publicly to be Peter from Simon. And guess what? He was given all these keys, keys of the kingdom. But he never wrote more books. He never reached more people than Paul. Why? Because Paul had an ability to access the realm of mysteries. That's why he says every time he speaks, behold, I show unto you a mystery. So it is important for you to understand what I am saying. So it's important for you to learn to continue, to continue learning in and out of season. In and out of season. Learn, 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 learn. Interpretation is the most important thing. And what hurts me when it comes to interpretation is because most prophets are not false prophets. I'm talking about prophets who are called by God, but every time they prophesy, it doesn't come to pass, and they want to talk to people, and it doesn't come together. Yet they know they themselves, they are not false prophets. Right? It hurts me because they are failing to interpret. It's not that they don't have the revelation. They had the revelation. But they are failing to interpret. Just um, this past Sunday, I gave a prophecy and I said, this is the month of fire. And for you to know that this is a month of fire, this is what you're going to see. Buildings are going to burn in this location, this location. And guess what? The following day, buildings started burning right uh, where the apostle was saying, words that he released, exactly those words. And some of you, probably you have seen the video already. So why would that happen? How will that happen? Does it mean every time one sees fire for that to happen and for them to come and say fire? Well, not every time. In this case, I saw fire and I saw fire clearly. But in other cases, it can be a different thing. You just need to know how to interpret it. And sometimes you can know it's fire by seeing people arguing. Listen, there are so many ways that God will show you something. You need interpretation. The last one, last but not least, is what I call prophetic application. This is you dealing with delivering. Because now you have received the revelation, which is the will of God. You have received interpretation, which is what it means, but how you then deliver it, how you apply it now, determines if it will come to pass or not. Because when you apply it, you must always know whether your prophetic word is conditional or unconditional. Now I'm going back to Jonah when I told you that I will come back to him. The prophecy he gave that never came to pass is because Jonah gave a conditional prophecy. A conditional prophecy can be altered 
A conditional prophecy can be changed. You can say one thing and you turn, and when you look, results are different from what you said. It is not you. It was a prophecy. The prophecy was conditional. So people can do certain things, and that prophecy will be suspended. People can do certain things, and that prophecy will change. Sometimes it's not that people lie when they tell people the president of this country is going to be this if they don't pray. And guess what? They don't pray. And uh, you see the person and people were saying, but this one is going to be a president. It's not that they lied. No, 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 no. It's because the prophecy was conditional. So it's important for you to know, is this an unconditional prophecy? Is this a conditional prophecy? And of course, it's in the application where we should state and make it clear that this can be minimized. This can be changed. This cannot be changed, meaning cannot be stopped. So that even the one who's receiving that prophetic word will know what to do. Because remember, prophecies, according to Paul, are actually weapons that we use as well for spiritual warfare. Remember when he said, uh, this charge, this command I give you, my son Timothy, putting in remembrance the prophecies that went ahead of you, that by them you might as war a good war, fight a good fight. So we use prophecies to fight. So sometimes you must know what you're dealing with. Is it, condi is it conditional? Okay. If it's conditional, it means I can change it. It means I can stop it. It means I can minimize it. But if it's unconditional, it means I just need to prepare myself. I need to be ready. Just like the fair mind that came in Egypt in the days of Joseph. It was not something that they could pray against, though they saw it. They had to prepare for it. So it is important for you to know, as somebody in the prophetic office, what is what exactly. Last but not least, this will take time, but you are in the school. Since you now know all these things, What's more important than any of whatever I said today is to know your area of specialization. Is to know I'm a prophet, but who am I called for? Maybe if I was to give uh, divination, not divination, maybe if I was to just explain for three seconds what a prophet is, then I explain that, uh, what I need to explain. Prophets are deliverers by God. Meaning, whenever there is a prophet in town, deliverance has come. That's why the book of Hosea declares 12 verse 10. prophet Israel was preserved. Do you see that now? So once you say, I am a prophet of God, there is an unction to function in deliverance. But you cannot deliver yourself because God does not anoint people for themselves. So it is then important to know these are the people I'm going to deliver, but also this is how God is going to deliver them. Because every time God schedules somebody Shadows somebody's deliverance. He shadows, his, shadows it with his deliverer or with their deliverer. That's why he said to Moses in 
Exodus chapter 3, verse 7, I am come down to deliver my people. And he then explains, I'm going to take them from here to here. And then he tells Moses how he's going to do it. So even you in the prophetic, understand that you cannot be in the prophetic and you don't have an unction to function in deliverance. It's impossible. Write that down and never forget it. Prophets are agents of prosperity. Believe in the Lord thy God, ye shall be established. But believe in the prophet, ye shall prosper. You cannot be a prophet and speak against prosperity. No. And in this case, prosperity is not cars or all these things. No, no, no. We are talking about good health. Nothing missing, nothing lacking, nothing broken, both spiritually and physically. When a prophet shows up, your time has come. So prophets are agents of prosperity. Scripture declares, whenever a prophet was in town, the people prospered one way or the other. So it is important for you to embrace that because prophets are agents of prosperity. And when I say prosperity, don't be fooled by what is out there where people, uh, you know, they'll show people the God who buys cars and who gives cars and who gives houses and they don't show people the God who saves. I'm not talking about that. The God who delivers. Because the most important thing is for God to separate you with and from that which controls you and that is sin. Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God, so to say. That's the right translation. And the rest shall follow you. Prophets are not sent to everyone. So as a prophet, you're not sent to everyone. They are sent to certain people. Remember that. So you know your people. And prophets don't speak words. <laughs> prophets issue verdicts. If you look throughout the entire scripture, the word of a prophet is the word of the Lord. It is dangerous for you as a prophet not to know which area has God called you in. Not only will you delay yourself, you will delay the people that you are called for. I will give one more example and I hope you will hear this. When God spoke to Jeremiah, he said, a prophet to nations. But when God then spoke to Ezekiel, he said, a prophet to the house of Israel. So we have a prophet to nations. We then have a prophet to the house of Israel. Both are prophets. But guess what? They are called for different people, different locations, in different times. What would have happened if Jeremiah tried to prophesy the house of Israel? he will have missed the voice of God because he's in a wrong frequency. What would have happened if Ezekiel tried to prophesy nations? He would have missed the voice of God. Because in the prophetic, you always grow within the confinements of your calling, of your area of specialization. You can't grow in something that God did not call you for. You only grow in that which God has called you for. So it is important that as a prophet, you know exactly this is who I am. Remember, this class is uh, the school of the prophets. We are not talking about signs. You have a prophetic gift on all these things. I have that in other classes. But in this class, we are strictly talking about that. And if one way or the other, you feel in your spirit, uh -uh, Apostle, Ms. Mzokitin Credit has been talking to me. It is important for you to check out another Subject, another course we have in the school of ministry, and that is uh, the school of seers and dreamers, because there we expand and we go deeper, because some people are not prophets, are seers, and some are dual prophets, meaning they are a seer and a prophet, and some they are a seer and a dreamer, and some they are just watchers with the desire to prophesy. It is important that you learn until you find yourself. Because until you find yourself, you're not ready to lead anyone. We don't try God's things. Gifts are given by the Spirit, but manifested by faith. I know that. But in manifesting them by faith, God cannot use you and not know he's using you. Yes. God is not just a God who takes chances. That's why he, those that he called, he predestined. 
not only that, he also justified, glorified. So he's, he's prepared. He knows what he's doing. 